So one of the things that uh, we started doing last time, I guess it occurred to us as we look at calendars that pretty much every day is a holiday. And every day is in fact, probably 10 or 20 different holidays. February 3rd, we did, discovered was uh, what? National Golden Retriever Day. And um, there's some other food related holidays attached to it as well. Uh, February 17th, that is today. Uh, anyone know what today's holidays are without Googling it? Of course not, because the only thing that really makes a holiday significant is the number of people that actually celebrate it. And I don't know how many people actually celebrate this stuff. So if you're from a part of the country that knows what the heck um, this thing is, and we'd love to hear about it in comments. So apparently today is National Championship Crab Racing Day. This is a holiday. Uh, if you type in, you know, today's holidays in Google, this will actually come up as one of those things. And I guess it's not like a thing that just happens in one place, but in many parts of the country, they just, uh, they'll just start racing crab. But I, I, do they, I don't know if they eat the losers or something at the, at the end of the race. I don't know how that whole thing works, but seems pretty strange to me. If you've had any of you have partaken in this, uh, we'd love to hear about it. Uh, but we also have some food-related holidays, too. But before we jump to the food-related one, here, actually, this is an interesting thing. Who can find, among all of us, right? You know, everyone, everyone watching, who can find the most obscure food-related holiday that is recognized by Google? So you can't just make up some holiday yourself and be the only person observing it and have that count. But what is something that if you type it into Google at the top, you know, where it gives you an answer, it recognizes that holiday on a specific date. Who could find the absolute most obscure food-related holiday, right? There's a lot of them, but uh, let's see who can actually find the most interesting one. Today is February 17th. It is also National Cabbage Day, which is actually a very important holiday. Um, the thing that really surprised me as we decided to look a little bit more at cabbage is just how incredibly common it was uh, in restaurants. Um, so Claire, you, you actually for the, Mike, I'm guessing you have not seen the number yet, right? You don't know what cabbage penetration is um, from menu trends? Or no, do I don't, I mean, I saw, I looked at the deck, but I don't remember what the exact percent. Okay, was. so can you guess, what's, what's your guess as to what percentage of restaurant menus feature or specify cabbage. And how about all of you? Can anyone take a guess? Um, well, I mean, and now you just kind of- US restaurants by, in this case. Cause you said you were surprised by how many have cabbage. Oh, menus, I screwed so, it up already, huh? Yeah, so I feel like it's gonna be way higher than I would have thought. Um, I don't know, 20%? I mean, it's like a third. Yeah, so 20, wow. well, so, so 20 percent like I would have guessed like 10, so 20 would have been surprisingly high to me. Uh, Claire's right, it's, it is literally exactly a third. 33% penetration is actually really quite high. Um, and it looks like we hit a, you know, we've been growing with cabbage for a while and we see a, a post COVID uh, cabbage retreat or something, but uh, cabbage is actually becoming, it had been growing in popularity for quite some time and actually appears on one third of restaurant menus, which sort of surprised me. Uh, and if you look at it, I guess you have basically 60% of people in this country either love or like cabbage. This is from our, uh, our flavor service. And about 6% of people hate cabbage. So slightly polarizing, but not nearly as bad as liver or black licorice. Um, what's interesting though, is we have a cabbage problem with the younger generation. So this is also from flavor. On the right-hand side, you can see some, some bars going across and this is, um, you know, essentially how much people of different types love cabbage. And boomers, Gen Xers, millennials, you know, they're all digging cabbage, but there's a cabbage problem with Gen Z. Cabbage has a Gen Z problem, and I don't know what's causing that. Is it, you don't really encounter cabbage in a delectable format until later in life? Or is there actually a generational thing going on where this generation will forever have depressed levels of cabbage affinity? Uh, anyone care to offer a theory? 
I feel like they're not thinking it through. Like, do they like kimchi? Do they like coleslaw? Or they're just like, oh, I don't like cabbage. <laughs> oh, that's true. Because Gen Z, uh, you know, the younger people probably more likely to say they like kimchi, but they don't think of it as cabbage. You're saying. Yeah. Well, I feel a- like if we rebrand cabbage as just giant Brussels sprouts that are like good for TikTok and social media, then Gen Z will get really. Wait, is that what a cabbage is? The, I mean, a Brussels sprout is a baby cabbage. So, yeah. It is. Yeah, I mean, look at it. Basically. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know it was in coleslaw. Can you call the organizers of National Cabbage Day and, and make that recommendation? That's a great idea. You can start a TikTok thing. Uh, okay, so that's called us wasting time to allow all of you to join into the and, and log into the webinar. If you all will just continue chatting and when you do um, hit that chat button, make sure you choose either all panelists and attendees or choose everyone so that when you are chatting, Um, Everyone can see it, not just the five of us. Okay, let's get started. Uh, We have an esteemed panel, um, actually for a number of folks that are from Data Central's content team. We have Mike, we, Jared, and Claire all joining us today, each to share some of their expertise on just what's happening in the world of food and beverage. Um, Mike, I wonder if you could help kick us off with just some interesting things that are going on that you found surprising. Sure, yeah, I get to do the fun stuff. So I think this is of everything that we're gonna talk about, probably the one that people have seen in the news the most, which is that McDonald's filed some patents to enter the metaverse. So if you followed, you know, some of our 2022 trends webinars in January, you know that we have a big section on the metaverse. And we talked about how, you know, the metaverse is kind of gonna be the vocab word for 2022. If anything, I think it's moving faster than anybody even thought it would. If you have metaverse like in your Google alerts, like you get multiple news stories every single day. Um, So McDonald's patent is basically that they would create restaurants inside these virtual worlds. You can take your avatar into that virtual McDonald's and then you can order food at that virtual McDonald's and have it delivered to your house, which is kind of like what a lot of people think that restaurants will look like in the metaverse in the future. And it sounds weird, but I mean, if you consider right now, if you're on social media and you get an ad for DoorDash and it's like, you know, order a taco for lunch today and you click on it and you order that taco, it's pretty much the same thing. It's just kind of in a different virtual world, I guess you would say. So as of right now, it's just an, one more place where you can order food. Exactly, exactly. Do you, do you have a, an idea as to where this could go five, 10 years from now for restaurants? Uh, I mean, I think you could see, um, one, I think you could absolutely see virtual streets that look like our like normal streets, like downtown and everything. But also, like, I mean, like, you're not limited by, like, you know, what a restaurant needs to look like in the real world. I mean, restaurants in, like, the virtual world could look insane. They could be massive. Um, you know, they could have, you know, your order taker could be a dragon. It could really, like, I mean, it's the, only limited by your imagination, really. So... In the early days of the internet, I think it was like 1999, 2000, there was a, I think a company or maybe even a couple of companies that were trying to come up with like a device that would, um, you would hook up your computer and it would create different scents and it it could create like different Mm -hmm. aromas and smells Mm -hmm. for whatever it wanted. So it would be like um, another way of interacting with, uh, with the internet essentially. And you just load different smell cartridges in there and you could have, you know, pizza smell or flower smell or whatever. Do you think that with the metaverse, you know, if you're merged, you have this thing in your head, you have a piece of virtual food in front of you, you can just put like some nondescript piece of food in your mouth that's flavorless, and then it's sending you scents through the internet. Mm, that's interesting. Device, and it's like I'm, you're eating what you're seeing in this virtual world. Probably. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I don't see why that wouldn't be possible. Uh, all right, let's give it five years. <laughs> let's see. Uh, okay. And then, I mean, like I said, you know, if you have a Google alert for metaverse or NFT, you get news stories every day related to the food industry. And so, I mean, these are just from the past week, so you can see how much is happening. And a couple of these, I think, are incredibly interesting. The Lunchbox story at the top there is, so Lunchbox is basically an ordering platform, and they put together this virtual restaurant that they auctioned off. And whoever bought this virtual restaurant could then retrofit it to their brand. So Bear Burger actually bought it. They can retrofit it to the Bear Burger brand, and then they can launch it in the metaverse. For them, all the proceeds from it went to charity. But, you know, I just think it's an interesting example of, you know, the types of brands who are getting into this space. 
The chicken cone one is also interesting. So chicken cone is a Florida based um, fast casual restaurant where they serve chickens in cones actually. Um, and so they launched this NFT or they called it a token. And basically each token is tied to some geographic area in the US. And if you purchase that token, then you got 50% of the franchise fee of any restaurants that open in that area in the future. And then you get 2% of all um, royalties from that area in the future. So basically by order, by purchasing this token, you are purchasing future chicken cone build outs in various geographic areas across the country. Does that feel like uh, NFTs open the door to lots of multi-level marketing types of things in the future? I mean, that, there's a lot of YouTube videos about that. I mean, like, look at those scammers that were just arrested the other week. Um, there's definitely some not great stuff going on with NFTs and uh, crypto coins. Anything else on this page, Mike? Um, no, I mean, I, you can, you know, read about any of these. I thought those were just, like, two particularly interesting yeah. ones. Okay. And then, um, so this is, this was also in the news. So Japanese freight companies in the past three weeks were the first companies to launch autonomous container ships. So they have been launched in other countries, but they had humans on board just to make sure that everything went okay. These were the first ones that actually had no people on board. So the first one launched, um, it traveled 161 nautical miles, which I don't know what that equals to. I'm sure somebody listening today knows. Um, but it traveled from one port in Japan to another port in Japan. It actually docked itself by launching drones that had the ropes on the drones. And then the drones would drop the ropes to the dock workers down below. Um, and so for Japan, they said, you know, they have an aging population. Um, you know, this would allow them to continue to be productive in the future. You often hear about how hard it is to work on these ships. Um, you know, it's a really long kind of, you know, um, like shift that you have to be on these ships. Um, and so, you know, that we hear a lot about autonomous freight vehicles and cars, but I think this is like an additional area that, I mean, in the future, you know, maybe some of the supply chain issues that we have right now, we won't necessarily have to deal with because the ships will be autonomous. What use will we have for humans in the future? I mean, if we get like some super intelligent <laughs> AI that can start shipping stuff to itself all around the world, what point is there in people at that point? <laughs> It'll be like, what do we need us for? Just be sitting yeah. in our, our floating lazy boy chairs. Okay, that's a little scary. All right. <laughs> And then speaking of autonomous vehicles, so this is a smaller scale option, but this is Yatai, which is um, from Yokai Express, which is a US-based autonomous robot company. And so this is the first autonomous robot restaurant. So you've probably seen a lot of, you know, robot restaurants or, you know, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, Sally the Salad Robot, and but those tend to be in one particular area. So they're not mobile. And then you see a lot of autonomous delivery vehicles that are delivering meals. But this is the first one that actually cooks the ramen on the vehicle itself. And so they launched it at the Super Bowl. You could, um, if you went to the Super Bowl pre-party, you could actually order ramen from it. But the idea that they have is that it would roam around college campuses almost like an ice cream truck. And so it would just go back and forth kind of on a predetermined path. And then students at colleges could, you know, use their phone to order ramen and run up there and get their ramen. So kind of a cool little thing. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. And then the fancy food show was last week. So unfortunately, I didn't get to it this year, but um, it's always fun to see some of the products that have come out. And this is um, what, a lot of beverage innovation, tons of beverages at the fancy food show this year. This is Taika, which is an adaptogenic coffee. So it's a Finnish uh, guy who created this brand. And he said that, uh, you know, he would drink coffee and he would get really jittery. And so he started taking adaptogenic pills with his coffee. And he figured, why don't I just put some of those stress busting adaptogens into the coffee itself? So it's in the coffee. But I think the cool thing is when he was doing the beta testing, he put his phone number on the cans so that people could, you know, send him ideas. I like this flavor. I don't like this flavor. And it was so popular. He just kept the number on the can. So like it's launched publicly now and you can actually text the brand and, you know, give them ideas and ask questions, which I think is kind of cool. This is definitely for what, uh, maybe a younger consumer. To, yeah. Oh yeah. I would say, yeah. Probably like not the, the split pea soup consumer. I mean, it seems like there's probably a lot of people that don't even know how to text a lightning bolt <laughs> to, to someone. <laughs> but what does it mean that this accentuates reality? What is that? 
I think so. The idea behind that is, you know, we drink coffee to give us that energy, but then this makes it a little bit more like I don't want to say palatable, but like so you're not jittery. So it's just you know like everything good about coffee for you know getting uh, through your day without all those bad things. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And then this is another one. This launched a couple of years ago, but I know they were doing samples of it at the show. Uh, but this is Molson Coors Golden Wing brand, which one, I just think the branding is really cool. Um, but I also just think like we still continue to see a number of these alternative milks hitting the space. And so we see a number of these, um, these brewing brands that are using barley because they're already experts in barley. Uh, Molson Coors, they actually work with their science, a scientists to develop a really high protein barley varietal that they use in this milk. I know Anheuser-Busch has their take two um, barley milk. So just, you know, some kind of next level um, alternative milks that are hitting the space from various brands. So do you use this as a regular milk replacer or is it some other application? Yeah, kind of like oat milk, like, you know. Something. It's like oat milk, yeah, awesome. Yeah. And then we got to end on a weird fun one. So I'm, I'm sure a lot of people heard this in the news, but the mayor of Hudson, Ohio, went on this really bizarre rant um, where he, you know, was talking about how if you have ice shanties on frozen lakes for ice fishing, it could lead to prostitution in the future. And uh, it, it, he made national news. Everybody thought it was, you know, this kind of weird, crazy rant. He actually ended up resigning. But so a local operator in the city of Hudson, Ohio, called Hudson since kind of took it and ran with it and they put a little ice shanty in the restaurant itself you could rent it uh, you know it was open over valentine's day and then they had a menu of cocktails that were i know they had one that was like the love shack margarita but kind of like themed around this idea so just kind of a fun way to play with like what was a really weird strange news story it was fun um awesome. <laughs> uh well thanks mike and if uh as we continue along for those of you that are using report prone again i think uh, many, if not most of you or your companies are now subscribing to Report Pro. Uh, here are some of the latest things you should check out inside Report Pro. So we have an awesome new report on managing staff burnout that's available to you. Uh, we have a quick look at what's happening with drive-throughs and what the future of drive-throughs looks like. This has obviously been a hot topic since the pandemic. Um, and then we're actually going to share a couple of stats today from a much beefier, uh, no pun intended, report around meat, uh, poultry, and seafood. This is our meat, poultry, and seafood keynote, also now available inside of Report Pro. So if uh, you're using it or your company subscribing to Report Pro, jump right in. You can find this and a thousand other awesome reports um, available at your fingertips. And just as a reminder, whenever you log into our Snap platform, you'll see some of the latest Report Pro content appear in the lower right-hand corner. Click that or click the Report Pro button at the top. It'll take you into the interface. You can see absolutely everything. Uh, okay, so let's share a couple of quick stats around COVID, and I'm going to have some questions for all of you and what you think is going to happen. So this is where we are with COVID cases. Uh, this is a seven-day rolling average. And uh, if you look at the dates, right, things started spiking with Omicron like crazy in the middle of December, uh, and we hit an absolute peak smack dab in the middle of January. And here we are um, essentially right in the middle of February. Uh, and we're almost right back to where we started. So we went down effectively just as fast as we went up. And uh, here's about where we are today. So we've had that peak and we're now back to pre-Omicron levels. And the thing that we've sort of observed through all of this when we ask consumers, you know, are you just really concerned about COVID for your own personal safety? How concerned are you? We never really saw that much movement during Omicron. I mean, I'm gonna go back to this previous slide. Just look at how high this peak is compared to any other prior wave, right? It trounces everything else in such a short period of time. But despite that, consumers said, eh, you know, I'm really not that much more concerned about it than I was previously. Um, so cases were not really a predictor of COVID concern or, you know, or, or, or being scared about COVID or anything. Seems like consumers have largely said, okay, I know how to live with this. I'm sort of, um, maybe to some extent I'm over it, or I just know how to deal with it right now. I'm not gonna let anything you know, really knock me off my rocker too much. And even coming into February, um, the start of this month, there are about 45% of consumers saying they're still very concerned, but that number is held constant, pretty, pretty constant for a number of months now, despite the Omicron surge. 
And as you've may, many of you maybe seen in, in your own backyards, uh, but it certainly seems like many big cities or states across uh, the US now are starting to actually um, ease or drop their pandemic restrictions. Um, DC, for instance, um, dropping its not only its mask mandate, but also its vaccination mandate, which had only been in place for about a month. Um, you know, half of all state mask mandates have ended in just the past three weeks. I think California expired today's the seventeenth. Uh, expired yesterday. Yesterday was the first day you could have gone maskless in California, for instance. Um, and Here's an interesting map. We actually got this one off NBC News, but this shows you um, the color coding for different states and which states don't have a mask requirement, which one and which ones had a mask requirement that was recently removed, and which ones in green still have a masking requirement. So I think you just ignore the orange, just look at the greens and the yellows, and you can see that basically half of those states are now yellow. And the question is, you know, how much longer will those other green states? stay sort of in, uh, in uh, with those policies. And I guess I had a question for all of us, and uh, I'm almost asking you to just, uh, you know, be a mind reader um, a little bit, but I think it's a fun little exercise. Why do you think all of a sudden we've seen a dropping or easing of mandates in just the past couple of weeks? So I'm gonna put up a poll. I'm gonna see what we all think as a group and then we're gonna see what consumers think as well. Um, so your options are, um, is it because states and cities are feeling political pressure to move away from restrictions? Is it because consumers have become particularly COVID fatigued in the last uh, couple of weeks or, or, or month? Or do you think there's actually new data um, that would lead to different decision-making uh, that guides our, our health policy? So is it political pressure, COVID fatigue, or new data? So um, we can keep this sort of anonymous. Claire, Jared, we, me, uh, Mike, I'm not gonna ask you your own personal opinions. I'm gonna ask you what you think the vote looks like over here in this group. What do you think is the number one vote? Definitely political, um, based on what I'm seeing from the chat. I think chat was very quick to chime in on this one. I think they're very, very certain about that one. Oh, that's cool. So you guys have the benefit of you can actually see the chat and I can't because I'm sharing oh, the screen. So I actually can't see what people are writing, but I can see how people are voting and enough of voted that I'm going to hit end poll right now. And uh, let's share the results. So here's our numbers. We want 55% political, 30% uh, burnout and COVID fatigue and 16% uh, there's new data that would shape this. And what consumers told us is effectively the same order, but not quite as extreme um, as we got here. The consumers more broadly, 42% say it's political pressure. And the number one, number two answer is burnout and COVID fatigue, 31%. And a little bit less than that, I believe that there's some new data. So uh, I guess I would ask uh, what makes our group different than consumers at large. I'm sure there's many differences there, but uh, over half of us think it's mostly political pressure. And if that is the case, so we're not going to make an assertion one way or the other, it would seem to follow that those green states will become yellow in the not so different distant future as that pressure just continues to spread and exert itself. So uh, we'll see. Uh, yeah. yeah, Jack, if I could add something here. Um, in the report, we were looking at um, this data across different demographics, and um, we we're seeing some really big generational differences for this one. So like over 50% of boomers um, selected um, state governments feeling political pressure. But Gen X and millennials um, are more likely to vote for burnout. And so I think, you know, whether like how many times you've lived through different pandemics and state responses probably has definitely like colored your impression of what government policy yeah. looks like during uh, a time of strife like this. But also, if we're thinking about millennials, this may be like the first major pandemic that like this generation is like feeling to this extent. Um, a lot of them are like new parents for the first time. So like, um, I can see the argument for burnout, right? Yeah, we do you remember any group, uh, whether it's generational or, or other um, cut of data, thought that it was new data that was driving this primarily? 
um no from memory um no like no nothing standing out nothing like yeah so okay so it's usually one of the top two so we also asked well now that you know you're seeing you know the news that some places are dropping mask mandates and easing restrictions what is that going to do to you as uh, an individual are you going to probably because of this news is that going to drive you to stop masking like is this is this giving you the green light to take that mask off uh are you going to you know basically bring a mask with you just in case but uh but relax your mask wearing but still have one handy um do you say you want more guidance before you change your habits you're just not quite ready to do anything yet or do you plan on just continuing to mask up um regardless of the fact that you're seeing mandates start to drop uh, we did anything surprise you about the spread that we saw here in, the, in these numbers? Um, a little bit, I think. Um, I was sort of under the impression that, like, once people got the go, uh, like the go ahead from government to like, okay, maybe you can stop wearing masks now, that a lot more people would say that they would stop wearing masks or they would stop it and like, we'll bring a mask just in case. But if you're seeing here, like, nearly sixty percent are saying um, that they either will continue mask up for the extended period of time or they want more guidance and even the like the quarter of consumers who are swayed to you know okay i'll stop wearing masks right now but i'll still bring one just in case um it, it it really shows that only very few of our consumers are saying that like okay good no more masks we're done right i mean it's pretty hard I, if, if, if you've been told for um two years that you gotta wear a mask you gotta wear a mask this is what it does this is why you need it it's pretty hard on a dime to just credibly believe that it's okay to just pull it off all of a sudden, right? right yeah. So I think there's going to be a little bit of an effect there. And I, you know, the question is, how long will people continue wearing these, even if they're not being asked to by mm -hmm. a rule? So um, how about for restaurants, right? So you're seeing the news that states and other places are starting to drop their mask mandates. Knowing that these mandates are dropping, is that a signal for you that it's now safer to eat at restaurants than it was before. And I can just sort of count the numbers out over here. About 13%, so only one out of eight consumers says, yes, knowing that these mandates are dropping are an indication to me that it's a lot safer. 20% say, yeah, it's maybe a little bit safer. Uh, and then a third say, no, this hasn't changed my perception at all. And then another 35% said, what are you talking about? It was already safe in the first place, right? And, and you know, th this was not even a consideration at all in my mind. So essentially 70% or almost 70% say no change or it was already safe. And I guess there's sort of two ways you can look at this. So one is the ending of mask mandates gonna automatically make everyone feel like, hey, it's super, super safe to go out and, and eat, eat in restaurants. No, probably not, right? It's gonna be a smaller percentage than that as you can see here, but that number is not zero either. So you are, should get some sort of an incremental lift in people that are more willing to go back out to restaurants again. It's just not going to be an overnight flood of new people. Um, we does that sort of, you know, uh, fit with sort of your view of this as well? Yeah, I think so. And something else I'd like to also point out with this is that, like, once again, thinking generationally, um, actually, fifty percent of Gen Z are saying that they're feeling either a little safer or a lot safer to to eat out at restaurants. So I think for a young generation that's been so heavily reliant on like fluctuating information to make decisions about themselves. I think having some sort of like widespread nationwide determinants that like, okay, maybe you can actually, you know, be a little bit more uh, like carefree about your decisions. I think it's, it's lifted their spirits a lot, certainly. That's actually interesting because our Gen Z sample, I think is, um, is either age 16 and up or age 18 and up. It's not like five and six year olds uh, mm -hmm. or anything. And at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw the people that were most concerned tended to be boomers. Um, now it sounds like Gen Z is reacting in that way instead. So I guess if you have a restaurant that primarily caters to, to Gen Z, you'll see a bigger lift from this than if you're a, more of a boomer-driven restaurant. Uh, so here's an interesting thought. We have, uh, I think the State of the Union originally was scheduled for February and got pushed back for whatever reason to March 1st, which is what, like two weeks from now? Is that two weeks? Almost exactly two weeks, maybe a little bit less than two weeks, something like that. And, you know, we talk about signals that consumers use to understand where we are in this pandemic and what their behavior should be 
And the question is, what is the message going to be on March 1st that's stated publicly, right? Because I think um, that could certainly have an impact on how consumers behave. And without being political at all, I'm going to ask you to um, predict what you think the message is going to be. And it could be many different messages, but primarily, which one of these three choices do you think is most reflective of what you're going to hear on March 1st? Is it that we've nearly beaten COVID, so now it's time to get back to our normal lives? Is it we still have a ways to go, but we're making decent progress? Or is it COVID is just as dangerous as ever and we must remain as cautious as ever? So is it a, you know, almost like a victory lap type of thing where, hey, you know, we beat this thing, you know, you know, great work, everyone. Let's get back on to our lives. We can drop more of these restrictions and, you know, we, we did a great job. Or is it we're still in the thick of it, but we know there's a light at the end of the tunnel eventually. Uh, or is it, boy, this thing is just as dangerous as ever. We got to be as careful as ever. Um, so we're actually having a pretty pronounced vote in one direction. Uh, you guys want to try to guess which one of these three is being most heavily voted on? The B. B is your guess? So uh, let me share our answer. It is in fact B uh, with 70% of the vote followed by A at 24% and then C at 6%. I'm guessing it's gonna be somewhere between A and B, uh, most likely. Um, we'll see, uh, but we'll find out in two weeks and what we'll do, um, that'll, that'll correspond nicely with our next webinar and we can then see how well we guessed and, uh, and grade ourselves on the next webinar. Okay. All right, and what you've also started to see now, and this is really interesting. So I, you know, I talked to my, my friend in, uh, LA, and he says, it's actually, it's actually sort of interesting. A lot of, the, a lot of people um, there, and I assume other cities uh, around the country, are starting to acknowledge natural immunity in a way that I don't think was as common previously. But one of the things that um, you hear from folks sometimes, and I think we actually saw comments to this effect in, our, in a webinar we did a little while ago, was that there's this uh, belief that natural immunity works for maybe three months and that's it. And I'm actually not sure where that comes from. So if anyone knows uh, what study or what piece of evidence that springs from, I actually would love to see that in chat. And uh, I think what you might see is a greater embracing of natural immunity by those folks, including by those folks who have not historically um, embraced the concept uh, because you're even seeing from a CDC study, this was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and you know, the fact that this is out there, I think is suggestive that you're gonna see more and more of this in the future. Even the CDC study, a CDC study said during the Delta wave, natural immunity ended up being actually a lot better than uh, vaccines alone, right? Um, someone that was vaccinated uh, compared to someone that was not vaccinated and never had COVID before. Um, a, a vaccinated person that never had COVID was about six times, you know, uh, better protected. But an unvaccinated person that had COVID previously was 29 times better protected. But if you got vaccinated on top of that, you do even a little bit better, but it's not a, a huge bump. You go from 29 to 32. The real difference is the six to the 29. And I think you're probably going to see more and more of this type of stuff get released, but uh, we'll see how it goes. And if that happens, I think the entire mindset around COVID uh, for the country starts changing pretty fast. Because remember that first chart we showed with where we are with cases and just how many people caught Omicron within the course of two to four weeks. If people start thinking that they're in good shape and they're protected because they've had the disease, uh, I think things get back to normal quicker than we would have originally thought. But there is another side of this, right? People are saying, ah, you know, maybe, maybe I'll start taking my mask off a little bit, but they don't, um, you know, it's not entirely universal. So we wanted to actually ask what it means for the people that are there to, you know, to help you in life, the, you know, the customer facing servers and whatnot, whether it's in a retail store or in a restaurant. And we asked consumers, 
in light of all this, how long should cons should customer facing workers continue to wear masks? And here are the numbers. So 28% say, eh, you know, you can take your mask off now, regardless of whether or not you've been vaxxed. Another 19% say you can take your mask off now as a, as a customer facing uh, worker, but only if you've been vaxxed. And then you have um, over half, 53% that say either, you know what, regardless of any of that, uh, even though things, you know, mandates are dropping and whatnot, uh, we want you to continue wearing masks for now and, you know, for the foreseeable future. And then you have 21% that say, I want them to always wear masks, potentially forever. Uh, so there's, you know, there's certainly some lessons here for the restaurant industry. And I think we said very, very early on, um, the term that we used was overt sanitation in that very first week of the pandemic, which is you have to really show the customer that you're taking this thing seriously and you're the most hygienic place on earth. So there's no worries. I mean, back then we thought stuff could like stick to surfaces and you're scared to touch things and whatnot. You had to wipe things down all the time. Um, this has persisted that one out of five consumers today thinks that customer facing staff should wear masks in perpetuity. Uh, so it does feel like there's a little bit of a dichotomy of, of you know, the, the worker class versus the customer class, because, um, you know, a lot of those customers, consumers say, well, I don't plan on wearing a mask forever in my life, but I expect the people that serve me to. Uh, for restaurants, though, it seems like the expectation is that masking continue for a while. 53% say that I want masks to continue being on that face for now or for the foreseeable future uh, uh, or in perpetuity forever. So uh, the numbers for workers are not quite the same as the numbers for people. Any signs of the COVID-19 pandemic, whether it's distance tables, servers and masks, et cetera, persisting beyond this point would ruin the experience of dining out. So we asked people um, for a few different statements, and this is one of them, if you agree or disagree with that statement. I'll give you the answers to the first one, right? So hey, if there's any signs of the COVID-19 pandemic, that's gonna make uh, you know dining out sort of a crappy experience for me because it's gonna remind me of all the bad stuff. So 56% of consumers agree with that statement and 44% of consumers disagree with that statement. Well, almost an even split. So now I'm gonna ask you all to guess. So here's the statement. COVID-19 will never go away and it's time to move on and live with it as, it's, as it is now an endemic disease like the flu. So without saying what you personally think, I just wanna know what you guess consumers typically think. Do they agree or disagree with the statement? I guess you could say what you think too if you want, but I, I'm really asking what you think consumers voted. Uh, what are we seeing, We I'd see your head nodding up and down. Are we getting? Uh, someone, yeah, a bunch of people are getting really close. Most people, everyone's saying agree. Everyone in the chat is saying agree. Um, we've got someone who's saying 70% agree, 30% disagree, um, which I think is very, very close to what the actual number really is. It's shockingly close. That person wins a prize. 68 to 32 is the number. Uh, it is time to stop mandating people's behavior in response to COVID. Everyone has access to masks, tests, vaccines, and therapeutic treatments. Agree or disagree, or what do you think the proportion might be? So this one's a little more uh, maybe controversial than the previous statement. We've got two people saying 50-50. Um, someone's saying 60-40. Um, Anyone going more extreme than 60-40? Uh, nope. 60-40 is, oh, there's someone saying 90%, but 60-40 is sort of the chat consensus right now. So that's a pretty good, if that's, a, yeah, if that's the consensus, uh, you all are fantastic because that's exactly what it is. So we do have a preponderance that agree. I mean, if you do the numbers, about 50% more people agree than disagree with the statement. So uh, again, I think we saw earlier on, you know, why, why are these mandates easing? And consumers tend to think it's because of political pressure or the polling has changed or consumer sentiment has changed or it's COVID fatigue, which probably rolls up into this too. Uh, more people agree than disagree with the statement. This experience has shown me that the United States will do a good job handling a new variant of COVID or a different pandemic in the future. So without 
expressing your own sentiment, because I think we all have our, our, our own ones there. Do you think this country tends to agree or disagree with that statement? Or maybe it's too oh, wow. even. Um, most of the chat are saying something to the lines of 30, 70 agree or 20, 80, 20, 80, 25, 75. Yeah, so people are gonna say that like most people will say that the US has not done a very good job handling the virus. So interesting, uh, consumers as a whole think it's 50, think it's 50, 50. So uh, I guess uh, we have slightly different opinions um, on that in, in this group, but. Something, uh, yeah, something that's very interesting, Jack, about this particular exhibit is that like 56% of Gen Z actually say that the US has done a good job handling the new variant of COVID. And if we looked at the rest of this, of what we talked about generally, we're seeing that millennials and young folks are, um, I think getting to the stage now where they're a lot more eager to get to the point where they can sort of be a less careful about it, or they're, they're willing to sort of like get closer to where they want to be. Um, whereas I think um, older folks, boomers, Gen X are still going to be a little bit more guarded when it comes to all of these uh, mandates, messaging, all of these things. It's just an interesting observation to see how things have yeah. changed generationally for the past two years. I feel like there's going to be an endless amount of analysis and deservedly so about the impact that the pandemic has had on people's psyches and their attitudes toward life. Um, you know, if, if you're a younger person and, you know, this is one of the, the few big things you've experienced in your life, it probably impacts you in a different way than if you've lived through a war or, you know, done all this other stuff. Um, and then that next generation after Gen Z, which I don't think has an official name yet. We've heard things like Generation Alpha, I think, has been tossed around and some others. It's going to be really interesting just how they approach life in general, having been through this experience. It, uh, th there's so much analysis that needs to be done there, and uh, lots of it's going to be controversial. So we'll talk about that at some point, maybe. Anyways, uh, let's, we're going to get into the next, the next piece here, and we're going to look at information about meat. So we've obviously, obviously been talking a lot about plant-based for, for years now, and I feel like we've maybe neglected um, meat-related stuff, you know, more than, more than we should have. And we've just published our uh, really, really great keynote on meat, seafood, poultry. So we want to actually take a look at what's happening in the world of meat. And we learned a few interesting things. And one inter uh, this key disclaimer is all the data that we're about to see is among meat eaters only. So we excluded people that don't eat meat. And we're going to look at the remaining meat eating population and what they're doing around meat consumption. All right. And just like Jack said, so everything we're going to look at only was asked to meat eaters. So anyone who doesn't eat these foods is not included in this data. Um, so to kick this off, we asked our consumers, what type of animal uh, represented the protein in your last dish? And, you know, I think this is kind of, you know, obvious in a way, but it was cool to see that, you know, across all the animals on the planet and whatnot in the U.S., we really just only eat a handful um, that, you know, comprises the majority of what we eat, uh, cows, turkey, salmon, shrimp, you know, a little turkey and pigs too. Um, but for the majority of it, it's, it's pretty much cows and chicken. Definitely more diversity in the seafood space than in uh, the other types. Yeah, very true. And, um, you know, like you were saying, like with, like I hear the word plant-based like 10 times a day, we're always talking about plant-based, but um, you know, at the end of the day, meat is one of the most loved foods there are. Um, here we see some data from Flavor of Matrix um, of consumers who love uh, an item on the y-axis and then have had it on the x-axis. And the thing this on the, the right-hand quadrant, if you click Claire, it should show um, the most loved foods. And we can see, you know, those varieties of meat, not only are them, they the most tried foods, they're the most loved foods. And you know, some of these plant-based alternatives, um, conversely, you know, are at the opposite end of the spectrum on here. So to clarify, the things in the upper right-hand corner are the things that are highly tried, many people have had them, and also highly loved. And that, that, that list of things in the upper right is dominated by meat items. Is that the, the view? Yeah. Yep, that's right. Yeah. So, so like, regardless of like all the buzz around plant-based, like at the end of the day, like meat is like some of the most loved foods there are. 
Let's keep going. Okay, and this is a good slide. So here we ask meat eating consumers, do you see these things as healthy? And you know, the majority of them do in all cases, um, especially for seafood and poultry. And you know, red meat's a little less, which I think makes sense. Like there was some news in recent years, I think that pork may be a carcinogen. Um, but you know, bacon's so good, I think we all you know know it's worth the risk. Um, and still, we'll still, still do see that uh, red meat is healthy too. And again, this is among meat eaters only, Correct. right? Yeah. So if we took the same view of non-meat eaters, you'd see essentially the opposite number. But the meat eating population is still the majority of Americans at this point, uh, the large majority. Uh, and I think this was kind of like probably the coolest finding from this research. So whatever we're looking at, we always ask, have you increased your consumption, decreased it, or kept it the same over the last year? And um, when we looked at meat, you know, in total, there weren't any big surprises or shifts. But when we broke it out generationally, we actually saw it was the younger consumers that um, were most likely to increase their meat consumption. And I think, you know, just going back to the plant-based, um, you know, topic, like plant-based foods definitely appeal more to younger consumers, but at the end of the day, younger meat eaters are still increasing their meat in intake. Yeah, so it's a good question about what this means for plant-based. So we've taken them, this is meat eaters only, but among people that eat meat, if you ask them, do you plan on eating more meat in the future, you get bigger numbers among younger generations and in particular, Gen Z. So the proportions of plant-based eating within each generation are different and you'd have more plant-based eaters, let's say in the younger generation. Yep. But of those that do eat meat, they're saying, yeah, I'm probably going to continue doing this and even more so going forward. Uh, I have a question about this picture, right? Because someone actually had it posed to that picture. Is that safe? Can you do that? I think there are people that uh, do just eat meat like this. I've seen it on YouTube and stuff. And you can make it into a dress like Lady Gaga too, maybe. I don't know. Didn't we a do lot this? Of different things. Like evolutionarily, didn't we do this? In, in like the history of, of people? Like, wasn't there a time before fire or something and this is how we ate? It's probably okay, right? Yeah. We're not recommending it, but it's probably fine. <laughs> if, it's, okay. if it's got in that day, I think. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, and then, you know, this, this slide kind of just illustrates how, you know, much uh, consumers love meat. So we asked meat eating consumers uh, in each of these categories that eat these categories, when's the last time you had a dish with one of these proteins? And we can see that across the board, most consumers did have um, a dish in the past week with uh, one of these proteins that eat them, uh, especially for poultry and red meat. And, you know, seafood's not as high. And I think that, you know, the seafood landscape's a little bit different uh, because there's a lot of regional variation, whereas like you can go anywhere in this country and get a bucket of chicken. But I think that, um, you know, the seafood's weighed down a little bit by like certain inland regions, more or less. Yeah. And one thing we've seen with seafood, it's actually sort of interesting. If you ask consumers overall what their interest in uh, different proteins are, um, seafood tends to do better with boomers as a whole. And it changes, the, and this is largely because most seafood prep, and this is more true of seafood than it is for, for beef and chicken, um, seafood prep at restaurants tends to be more traditional, right? It's like the, the grilled salmon with like, you know, some lemon or something. Whereas you don't see all sorts of more interesting, like creative expressions, I think typically with beef or chicken where, you know, you have more experimentation there. Those same consumers, those younger ones that say I'm not as interested as let's say boomers are with seafood. As soon as you introduce interesting flavors into the mix or change up the format a little bit, now they like it, right? When the fish comes inside of a really cool taco with an interesting sauce, now they're all about it. But if it's just like that grilled piece of fish, they want something more interesting than that. So it's not an aversion of seafood. It's, uh, it's really just how do you serve it in a way that feels more contemporary? And the report kind of explored that too, you know, asking what would make consumers eat more seafood and like preparations like that were, if not the top motivator was one of the top motivators. Uh, keep going. Okay, and uh, taking a look at some operator data, and this one pertains specifically to red meat, but 
in a lot of ways mirrors some of our seafood and poultry findings too. Here we asked, what are the main challenges you have in serving meat? And, um, you know, we, we all know meat has a short shelf life. It has to be uh, prepared, you know, very carefully. Staff has to be trained to make it properly. And, you know, that is somewhat of a prevalent challenge, but nothing's more of a challenge than high costs and fluctuating prices. And, you know, if you think about it, often red meats can be the most expensive component to a dish and fluctuating prices uh, definitely will make yeah. pricing a menu difficult. I think we saw this a couple of weeks ago in our last webinar where um, uh, operators said that the fluctuating costs of beef is what most concerned them about food inflation more so than any other product. But I would say that notion of price volatility of, of meats is actually a generalizable insight. Uh, we've surveyed um, tens if not hundreds of thousands of, of operators uh, over the years. And we often ask, hey, what are the things that keep you up at night or that are an issue for your business? And even more so than the cost of product is the volatility, volatility of prices of product. Um, and obviously right now we're going through a period uh, of exactly that. So I think one of the things that, that you can do if you're a supplier to the operator community is help them get a little more consistency and to sort of flatten their curve a little bit, whether it's in uh, relative product availability or giving them tips on how to sort of maximize the usage of the product or versatility or to sub out one product for another as needed to combat that price volatility. Um, all that stuff helps. It's not just about the price itself, it's about the fluctuations in price that operators really care about. Uh, okay. All right, last one for me. And I think this was, this is my favorite slide in the report. So. We had um, mega trends for each of the categories in the keynote. Um, and one thing uh, I wanna look at was differences in meat consumers affinity between plant-based and lab grown. And, um, you know, I'll just say like across all the mega trend, trends, lab grown meat was the least appealing concept uh, currently to consumers. But with that being said, um, still more than one in 10 of them do you find the concept appealing? And why I think that's significant is that you can't go to the store and get lab grown meat now. So there's no consumer trial here uh, for this appeal. And one thing we've observed you know, so many times, uh, especially since the pandemic uh, with technology is that when consumers trial something, they're much more likely to like it. So I think that you know, in some ways, this is a trend to keep uh, your eye on uh, as, technology scales up, it maybe becomes more available. I know as a vegetarian, I'd love a lab-grown filet mignon. Um, I get that all the time. I think it's ironic, Jared, that you're a vegetarian and you contributed greatly I to our meat report. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we've actually seen this number go up over the years. You know, if you looked at the interest in, let's say, lab-grown or cultivated meat or clean meat or cell-based meat, um, years ago, it was lower. It continues to go up. And this actually follows one thing we've been talking about for a while, which is consumers are actually now interested in foods that are created through science and by science if it somehow helps the world in a positive way, right? It's not, you know, scientifically formulated foods that are created in a factory. That's not appealing. But foods that are created through science that somehow do something good for the world, there is interest in and will continue to grow. You know, uh, we had the first, I think the world's first public tasting of lab-grown chicken nuggets mm -hmm. at our Foodscape event a couple of years ago. Uh, and the stuff's getting really, really close. So we're gonna see more of this. Uh, Jared, thank you. And then in the last few minutes, uh, we'll bring on Claire. Claire, I know you're gonna be a little bit rushed here, but talk to us about seasonality. Okay, uh, switching gears. Um, and everyone saw the sneak peek uh, when I shared the wrong presentation and we learned cabbage uh, skews to all, uh, all seasons mostly. Uh, here we looked, we saw this earlier for cabbage. Uh, this is seasonal over time in our menu trends database. So what percent of menus uh, call out seasonal? And you can see there in orange that there was a big dip last year. Uh, we've talked before, there's been a big dip in plenty of things. Uh, seasonal in particular, when you're having trouble sourcing stuff is not gonna be a call out you want to feature. So we do expect it to have some rebound though we think there's uh, more to say about seasonal. Here we have, the seasonal affinity from our flavor database and experience. Overall, 24% of people love seasonal, what's not to like about something in season. But then we were curious, 
I think back, six um, percent of people hated cabbage. Only one percent of people hate seasonal stuff. So no one hates anything seasonal. People love seasonal. <laughs> seasonal is non-controversial. However, uh, we do think it might be losing some meaning or require perhaps more specification. So uh, many years ago, we talked, you know, is seasonal the new fresh is now what we're thinking. For a long time, everything was fresh. It sounds great for things to be fresh. Nobody wants unfresh food. You'd see the same ratings. Nobody hates freshness. Um, but we are seeing that there is sort of a lack of meaning. It's on so many meat, uh, menus. Why, why say it at all in some ways? Um, so even just simply saying uh, seasonal fruit, like saying it's fruit, like your classic seasonal fruit cup has higher affinity. 46% love the idea of seasonal fruit, um, far more than love seasonal vegetable. That might have something to do with people's affinity of fruit versus vegetable overall, um, or just a general perception of um, fruit has, you know, in season fruit is really the very best fruit there is. Um, so the more you specify, the better. And the reasons for its seasonality is important. Uh, so we have, uh, I think we've used this ex uh, example yeah. before. Because and if I could maybe just jump on this, I actually took this picture myself. So I was actually uh, in sort of wine country. And I think, Claire, your point is that the word seasonal has become generic and it's lost meaning by itself. The more specific you could wrap things around the word seasonal, the better it is. Just like we saw with the word fresh was everywhere. And then consumers started instead responding to things that were more specific, like, you know, farm fresh and not just, you know, fresh, fresh. So I took a picture of this place uh, in Northern California, uh, El Molino Central. I don't know if it's still there or not, but it was great. If we go to the next page. I think this is the single best expression of season, you know, seasonal promotion I've ever seen in my life. It cost all of 10 cents for them to print out the sign that they printed on their own paper. And it says, dear customers, for the next few weeks, we'll have Seville oranges, one of the necessary ingredients for Yucatecan cooking. We hope you get a chance to try sickle pak, our pumpkin seed dip, salbutes with cochinita pork and papazulas. The egg enchilada is supposedly the first enchiladas made by the Mayans. It's a short season, but we think worth the wait. I had zero interest in this thing at all coming into the restaurant. I walked away with a tub of that stuff because of this sign. This is the ultimate way to do seasonal well, not just slapping the word seasonal on something, but really explaining and telling the story and saying, oh my God, I get to have like some of this early Mayan cooking that only lasts for a couple of weeks and I'm gonna miss it if I don't jump on the, you know, jump on the opportunity. So look, this is very hard to do at scale. If you're a big chain, obviously it's tough, but I hope we can be inspired by um, this way of thinking around seasonality. I don't know if Claire, if uh, you agree or disagree, I definitely agree. And we did look at the data to see what that could look like. So we usually look at our um, seasonal data in total. Uh, and here we looked at your fast casual and casual dining chains, which tends to be those that um, might have access or um, skilled staff in many cases where they can lean more into that true seasonal produce. And I looked at things that were produce or item related. So these are sort of the top five uh, that make sense in that category across all of your seasons. And then we did uh, pull out from scores some examples of what that could look like. And I think the more we think about, um, we have supply chain challenges and we wanna show off seasonal, um, thinking about things that can, that freeze well, but still you can highlight. So here we have spring peas. Yes, it'd be nice if they were fresh shelled. Yes, we could probably also use frozen and it'd be okay. Um, the fresh watermelon, the more you lean into beverage, the more likely it is that you have something that you can consistently keep on the menu. And it can be as simple as this home style chicken pot pie. They just slapped cranberry sauce on the side and it has a pretty high score and like way higher than uniqueness than an average chicken pot pie would have. So it doesn't have to be as exclusive as, you know, one week, month long season of an orange. Um, but the more we think about those micro seasonal, it doesn't have to be again, a produce item. We're seeing more and more, you know, shark week, um, you know, that's a short time frame, but it has that interest level for a certain consumer. Let's look just at Halloween, just at October. We don't have to look at fall in totality. Yeah, I think there's a lot of just getting specific is good, right? That's a general rule you could apply to virtually all things food. Um, Claire, thank you. We went over again. Uh, I apologize. That was my fault. Uh, so sorry only about that. Only a minute, that. though. That's pretty good for us. Yeah, we do. only a minute. Um, but if you all join us in two weeks, we're going to have some fantastic stuff. And we can also validate whether our guesses on the message at the State of the Union was correct or not. Uh, so we'll see you in two weeks, everyone. And uh, to the Data Central team, if you all could stay on for just a minute while we close this thing out. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in two weeks. It'll be great.